Yeah, so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Bill, we're halfway through this week's material, and I haven't seen one single rectangle class yet. This is a travesty. So yeah, fine, cool your jets. Ever heard of saving the best for last? I've got one here. I think it's worth the wait. So I have another implementation of rectangle, and this one even drags in our friend the point class. So one other way of representing rectangles, we've already seen a few different basic ways of doing it, is I could choose to represent the rectangle by two points in space. So I could say the rectangle consists of the point at the lower left and the point at the upper right. And because I know it's a rectangle, uh, it's pretty easy for me to figure out where all the other corners are and ask questions like what's the width and what's the height and then what's the area. So the width would be the difference between the x-coordinates of the upper le lower left and upper right point and the height would be the difference in the y-coordinates between the upper right and lower left point and the area is just the width times the height. Um, this example is meant to demonstrate a few different points, uh, I guess pun intended, of what happens if I store members uh, of one class that are themselves objects of a class type that might have constructors and destructors. So actually, it's a pretty expansive example, and we're going to unpack it even further in the next few videos. But this video is going to get at a few different things. So the first one is, I guess, just to acquaint ourselves with this uh, way of viewing the world, so the rectangle is two different points in space, we should write a little bit of code just to get acquainted. So I'm going to put the, I'm going to sort of draw a mini version of that visualization there just to remind ourselves what we're doing. So there's my uh, lower left and upper right points. And I would like to design my rectangle to be fully encapsulated. So when I use the rectangle in main, I'm still calling get width, get height, get area. And I have, I'm none the wiser. I've got no way of actually knowing what's really going on. Um, and, but I still internally am storing the rectangle as two different points in space. And we'll come back later and uh, try using a, a, a different constructors that allow us to leverage that a bit further. Okay, so my rectangle class now has two members, lower left and upper right. They are each of type point. So we'll scroll up a bit and visit this variant of the point class. This variant uh, prints out its, when you call its constructor, uh, its various constructors and its destructor. And in this case, the members X and Y are not private. They are public, so anybody can modify them. And this question is relevant to a future video, so I'll allow you to ponder it before then. Now I have my rectangle class. And the task here is I want to initialize my lower left and upper right points to be 0, 0. So this default constructor that's private, so nobody else can use it, but I still should initialize things. I will initialize lower left dot x equals 0. Remember that dot x is not private in the point class, so I'm allowed to do that. Lower left dot y equals 0. Upper right dot x equals 0. Upper right dot y equals 0. Okay, that was a lot of work. There we go. I'm actually going to copy this because I might need it again later. Uh, and then I have this second constructor. This constructor is one where you pass in, we'll call it the bounding box constructor. I'm going to pass in the x and y coordinates of all, uh, of all four coordinates of the two points. So the x and y coordinates of the lower left point, the x and y coordinates of the upper right point. Um, okay, so the first thing I'll do is I will set the, x, the um, members of my two point objects to be LLX and then LLY and then URX and U R Y. This is not the best way to do this. The next video will talk more about, I think, a more sustainable way of doing this. Our goal is sort of to explore that um, slowly, to sort of branch out from the basic idea. Uh, and then it says to throw a runtime error if the width or height is negative or zero. So there's a few ways we could try this. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to observe that when I'm done this, I will have written my functions get width and get height. So I could always call those to ask the question what the width and height is. So if get width is less than or equal to zero, then we've got a problem. Or if get height is less than or equal to zero. Okay, so if that happens, then I'm going to throw an exception. Uh, and it's going to be of type std runtime error. So std, I'm going to throw std runtime error and I'll say invalid dimensions. Okay, uh, and then there's a second constructor that's uh, closer to what we've been using all along, which is if you just give me the width and height, then I'm gonna assume that the rectangle, that this is just the point zero, zero, and that the width and height, and therefore that this is the point uh, w, or yeah, w comma h. So I'm gonna initialize the lower left point to be zero and the upper right point to be the width and height that you gave me. And then again, throw an exception if for some reason you gave me coordinates that make no sense. So I'm just going to copy this. And I'm going to say, well, lower left dot x is 0, lower left dot y is 0. The x coordinate of the upper right point is now the width that you gave me. And the uh, y coordinate of 
the upper right point is the height that you gave me. Okay, I think I've got the constructors sorted out. Uh, of course, I need to write get width, get height, and get area still. Um, I've got this that I'm going to come back to in a minute, which is the, which is the destructor for the rectangle. Uh, and then I've got a function called print that I might want to call. And now I've got get width and get height. Okay, so what is the width of the rectangle? Well, I think it's the distance between the x-coordinate of the point in the lower left and the x-coordinate of the point at the upper right. So I think it's going to be something like this. Return... Um, upper right dot x minus lower left dot x. Because of the way we've structured the constructors, we can be guaranteed, again, this idea this is on the left and that's on the right, we can be guaranteed that if I subtract the x-coordinate of the lower left from the x-coordinate of the upper right, the number will be positive, the width will be positive. And then the height is very similar. So height is the upper right, is the uh, y-coordinate of the upper right point minus the y-coordinate of the lower left point. And I think that's all I have to implement just to get the code to compile. So we'll try that. Uh, and I want to run it a few different ways. So first, there is a lot of output. Uh, a lot. And I want to unpack the output a bit. So uh, first, I mean, before we unpack the output, I want to show off all of this output. I also want to show you that in main, I am constructing objects of type rectangle. I never construct an object of type point. And we can see I am calling the constructor for a point. So that should already sort of ring some bells. We should now know, um, if we recall the way the rules for constructors work, we shouldn't be surprised that the point constructor gets called. Um, the next thing I want to do is observe that, of course, I'm constructing two rectangles with that basic width and height constructor. But what I'm going to do is I am going to modify R2 to use the bounding box constructor. So R2, in this case, would now be the rectangle where the lower left point is at 1, 1, and the upper right point is now going to be at 6, 10. Okay, just to make sure I use both constructors. So we'll now uh, compile and run that. And if we scroll up, sure enough, there's the width and height constructor being called for R1. There's the bounding box constructor being called for R2. Then it prints out some details of R1 and R2. Then it calls create unit square. And create unit square, as it turns out internally, calls the bounding box constructor. So we can see that's happening down here. And then we can see a bunch of destructor calls happening. And interspersed with those destructor calls for rectangles, we have the destructor calls for points. And that's what I want to unpack further. Before I do that, I will observe, because I'm going to comment out some of the um, different code that I have in main to make the output easier to parse, uh, observe that the first rectangle I created was um, width 2, height 2. So it goes from 0, 0 to 2, 2. That's the last rectangle destroyed. The second rectangle I create was from 1, 1 to 6, 10. That's the second, rectang the second to last rectangle destroyed. The final rectangle I create and the first rectangle destroyed is the unit square. Notice that destruction order is, as usual, the reverse of construction order, as we expect by the law of socks and shoes. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment out um, all of this stuff. I'm going to keep printing out the width, height, and area of R1. I'm going to comment out R3 altogether, but R2 still exists. I'm just going to try and, to try and clean the output up a little bit. Okay. So now what I want to talk about is we know now that the rectangle can contain instances of type point. The question then is point is an object. Point is a class. It has constructors and destructors. It shouldn't surprise us that the constructors and destructors are running because we know if an object has a constructor, a constructor must always be run. And to be clear, because it'll be important in the next couple of videos, exactly one constructor must always run. There must be one construction sequence that's followed. We'll see that this can involve running code that's distributed across multiple constructors uh, members, but only once is the object ever actually constructed. Uh, the other thing we'll observe is, before I actually run my width and height constructor for rectangle, the point gets constructed, the two points inside that object. So here is the width height constructor for my rectangle object. By the time I get to the print statement at the beginning of the constructor, both of the two point objects that the rectangle contains have already been constructed. That's a key detail. It makes sense that I have to do that because in the constructor, which is an ordinary member function except that it's called at a special time, inside the constructor I can use my point objects. And we know that it's not permitted ever to use an object before it's been constructed. That means if I can use my members anywhere inside the constructor, the members must have already been constructed before the constructor for rectangle began. And we can see evidence of that here. We can also see evidence when I use the bounding box constructor of exactly the same thing. The two point objects that are members of that rectangle have already been constructed. 
Now on the other side of things, let's look at the destructor. And you can glance at this, this uh, remark being made in the comment here. In the destructor, so here's the destructor, I print out rectangle destructor, and then I call a member function. And I'm allowed to do that. I can call a member function from inside the class in another member function. And the member function prints out the values of the two points. And I think it's clear from this that in the destructor, I can call functions or I can use the members directly. In the destructors, um, in the destructor for rectangle, the members of rectangle must still be usable. And just like how you're not allowed to use an object before it's been constructed, you're also not allowed to use an object after it's been destroyed, of course. And that tells us something. We actually can infer from this exactly what um, the order of destruction of members has to be, which is in the destructor, I'm allowed to use lower left and upper right. I'm allowed to use my members, my point objects that are members. That means they cannot be destroyed until after the destructor for rectangle is over. And that is the more general application of the law of socks and shoes. I, cons I ran the rectangle constructor after my points were constructed. Therefore, my points can't be destructed until after the rectangle destructor has finished. So the rectangle destructor runs. Once the rectangle destructor is done, then I can begin destroying the points inside the rectangle. And the same is true down here. When I run the destructor for the original rectangle R1, only after that destructor has finished am I allowed to run the destructors for the point objects by the law of socks and shoes. And all of this together means that exactly when constructors and destructors get run is actually dictated pretty strictly by the law of socks and shoes. We know that we need to construct the points before we run the rectangle constructor, and therefore, by socks and shoes, I need to destruct the points after the rectangle destructor. Now, we still have to talk a bit more about constructors. So one thing we could notice here is, okay, maybe our point object is encapsulated and we can't just go modify the members like this, but also, isn't there a fair bit of duplication here? Like, you know, there's this, um, then there's this that's almost the same in, the, in a different constructor. Wouldn't it be great if we could clean up our constructors to remove some of that duplication? And it turns out we can. 